everyone, and thank you all for being here. My name is Janine Rubenstein. I am editor-at-large at People Magazine and host of People Every Day podcast. One of the reasons I'm really excited to be here having such an important discussion about such an important work, Dear Evan Hansen, which is coming to theaters. You guys got a sneak peek, but we'll be there this weekend for the world to see. And uh, just a little bit about people. We started our Let's Talk About It mental health campaign about two years ago now. And it's where we invite celebrities, everyday people, advocates to just really come and share their stories and open up the conversation to let people know that they're not alone. And there's just so much synergy clearly with Dear Evan Hansen and the message, the movement that is Dear, Heaven, Dear Evan Hansen. So um, I'm excited to be here with this stacked panel. I'm so, so juiced to be here. And all the way at the end over there, I see you, <laughs> Dr. Harold. Koplowitz, excuse me, Dr. Harold Koplowitz, who is the president of Child Mind Institute. And of course, this is a nonprofit that is focused on just lifting up children with mental health issues, mental health disabilities, and learning disabilities. And he has been working with Dear Evan Hansen since the inception of the play and, and the show, and now to what we have now at the screen. So it's, he's done so much great work, and we're really, really appreciative to have you here giving your insight. And I want to take this to Ben and just ask about what Evan means to you. And, and when you look back on, on stepping into this portrayal, both on stage and now, um, what has changed and, and, and what does it still mean to you to bring this to life? Um, well, beautiful question. E Evan means really the world to me, so much to me. Uh, I've gotten the privilege of spending a lot of time with him and in his head and creating him for, for a long time. And, you know, I saw firsthand when we did the musical the ways that other people connect to Evan and see themselves in him and the ways that Evan's journey and the things that Evan goes through and the mistakes that he makes um, can change people's lives and really make people forgive themselves and, and heal internally. And I can't tell you the number of beautiful notes and letters and tweets and things that I've received from audience members over the years being affected by him. And I think to me personally, you know, I, much like Evan, am a very... Uh, non-confrontational and somewhat fearful person, very anxious person, and I often shy away from uncomfortable, painful, difficult uh, interactions, conversations, subject matters because of that fear and because of that non-confrontational sort of spirit, and sometimes miss deeper connection and, and, and meaning because of that, and I think seeing the, the really difficult uh, adversity that Evan has to face because he avoids those things and because he is so unable to break through that kind of shell, it's really encouraged me over the years and even more so now having done the film to push myself off of that cliff as many times as I can and to really put myself into those situations and cross those bridges and get over those humps and hurdles to get to the meaningful connection and the relationships that are worth it and the conversations that are worth it. Um, and then on top of that I think you know in this age of really scary you know kind of cancel culture and outrage and and um, there's, there's a real kind of finite feeling to, to, to criticism. And I feel like for me, watching someone like Evan, you know, make a mistake, do something wrong, and get to heal and learn to forgive himself and move forward, even if not in this big, fancy, everything is hunky-dory way, but just little steps forward after what he did and what he went through, to me, that's hugely inspiring. And it reminds me that there is so much room to give people grace and understand where people are coming from and to make room for nuance and gray area and just humanity whenever possible. So I, I feel like being him has been a real gift. Wow, I, yeah, just watching, I was like. <laughs> I wanna go to the wonderful women down there. <laughs> Let's talk uh, motherhood a little bit and I'm, I'm gonna throw this to Julianne, um, your portrayal of a mother. Um, I'm just wondering what you hope this does for other moms who are struggling uh, with those teenagers. I just felt like uh, you were caught between a rock and a hard place and just trying to figure out, uh, do I ask, do I ask too much, do I push, do I encourage, or is that too much? It was just so hard um, of a balance. So I'm just wondering, what do you hope, um, how has it affected you and, and, your, and your, your, whatever you do with your kids? And then also, what do you hope that moms can get from it? I guess, you know, I think what you always hope when you do something is that people see themselves, that they see, they see something that, that represents their experience as a human being, or in, in this case as a parent, a parent who cares very deeply about their child, who's a single parent as well, somebody who doesn't have any support herself. And, and there, it is that dangerous um, 
um, I'm sure the doctor could speak to this too, it's that dangerous time where your child is starting to differentiate and you need to give them the space to move away, but then you have to be nearby enough in case they need anything. And it's, and, and it's true, like how they are gonna, they will, they are moody. They will, you know, they, if you, sometimes you say the wrong thing and they go out the door and that's it, you know, and that's what Heidi's dealing with. And uh, our director, Stephen Chbosky, was really, it was, it was a wonderful direction. He said, remember, Heidi is always aware of what her child is going through. She never forgets that when he's going to school, that, you know, we're going back to school, all her cheerfulness is really about, oh, please, God, please, God, you know, let him get through this year. Let it be better than last year. You know, did you, you know, did you talk to your doctor? Are you taking your meds? Are you doing this? Like, the, you know, so that awareness, as, as well as trying to kind of be like just a regular mom, you know, that's happening all the time. And I think there are so many parents who are, are trying to walk that line, like how, you know, trying to be as present as possible and give their child the space to be who they want to be, too. So, yeah. Chris, I was really moved by the picture we get of how difficult it was to live with Connor. And I think that most movies don't do that. And, mm. where, you know, they mourn him, they grieve for him, but on a daily basis, living with him in the house was difficult. His sister says so. His father says so. His, his mother, as much as she misses him, recognizes it. And so that when a child really has a mental health disorder, the whole family is struggling. This is, you know, people can't forget that even the sibling struggles. And Heidi is walking on eggshells, as far as I'm concerned. You know, if he doesn't take the pill, if he doesn't write the letter, if he doesn't go to school, she's worried that, you know, something terrible will happen to her son. Uh, and I don't think she suspects that he you know, didn't fall out of a tree. But, you know, keeping your kid alive and keeping your kid healthy when they're ill is really uh, an incredibly hard job for parents. I mean, being a parent of a teenager is tough enough, but I think you captured that. As much as they miss their son, they also recognize how hard it was to be his parent. And Amy, uh, just how you channeled that, that kind of like hiding your grief and, and just trying to put on that, that face. And it just made me wonder, like, do you think she would have been better off if the lie just continued? Like, that, it almost felt like that. But wh what do you think? Well, it's a question I ask myself when playing her, if she knew. Mm. If she kind of suspected, but she needed. Sorry, it makes me so sad. I'm sorry. Yeah. She needed the Connor that Evan saw. And Evan did too, in a way. And so... I, I just always kind of wondered, and when you're playing it, um, if you go back and watch it, I, there are moments I can kind of feel that she wants to ask more, but she knows better because she's not, she's not ready to grieve yet. And Evan uh, provides a way for her to sort of postpone the, sorry, it kills me, to postpone the inevitable. Um, she's just not ready. And that's another way of grieving, you know, and I think, uh, I think that's something that's not shown often. Um, so anyway, this is my first time talking about it publicly, so it's, <laughs> oh, but basically, goodness. this is what I look like on set all the time, so Ben <laughs> only knows me as like weepy Amy, so. <laughs>the choice of words when describing suicide and how Connor actually died by suicide. But I think the first time it was said by either the parents or by some of the students, they said he took his own life. And um, I was just wondering if there was kind of an intention behind that word choice because I find it to be a bit triggering in the language that we use and the stigma attached to it. Anyone can speak to that. And then I was also wondering, as you all were really involved in this, obviously, as actors, if things were triggering for you and how you took care of yourself and your own mental health throughout that. Great question. That first one might be for you, Stephen. Yeah. Um, we have all along tried to be very intentional with our language. And I think uh, in the example that you mentioned, which is uh, his, his parents coming and telling Evan that, to us, that was always, that, that's how those, those characters described it, and that felt true to us in that moment, and th that these characters wouldn't necessarily have the proper language. Um, so that's sort of, uh, I think that that's sort of why that is. Um, and hopefully as the film goes on, other characters have a better understanding, especially the younger people. Um, I feel like 
that whole conversation about language is one that is very generational still at this point and still something that we all need more education on. Um, so I, I thank you for bringing it up. And, and I think that would be a good second question for Amanla or uh, Nick. Sure. Um, well, actually, I have a question for you. Um, what? <laughs> <It'll teach you. laughs> um, no, just um, I didn't. I didn't necessarily fully understand what you meant when you said that um, the the languaging was triggering. As in uh, the way that generationally, actually, like you were just mentioning, that people have been used to saying that someone took their own life as if it was a choice that they made. Or it's, and it implies, without intention, but it can imply that it was a sin or that they had a choice in it. Whereas when someone feels so depressed and hopeless, they feel that the only exit, or they think that the only exit at that moment is death to get out, right? And they can't face it. So I think if we can reframe the way that we speak about suicide and say that they died by suicide or they lost their life to suicide, right? Similar to someone dying by cancer or diabetes or whatever it is, you can make a huge powerful impact with just like the word choice, but it makes a lot of sense generationally, right, that you're actually highlighting that there is that change. Thanks for that answer. That's really helpful, I think, for us to consider thinking about as we continue on this journey of talking about the film. So thank you so much for that. And and Amanla <laughs> and, and Nick, no, the, the, I remember the second part of your question, which just was like, like how you guys yeah. Care while doing this, yeah. I was, oh, that's loud. Um, <laughs> I was in therapy virtually the whole time. Um, this was during the height of the pandemic, during the election. Uh, we were taking a lot of risks by doing the project and there was a lot of anxiety. Um, I was coming off a depressive episode after all the, uh, you know, the stuff that happened last summer. Um, and therapy for me was the thing that really helped me get through it. And uh, I still see the same person today. And I credit him with a lot of the progress I made during that time. Therapy. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm also in therapy. Um, therapy is super important to me. I'm a huge proponent of therapy. I believe everyone should be in therapy. Um, and not necessarily just at the moments in which you know, you're um, or having a depressive episode or an, or an anxiety attack or you're coming through a, a difficult phase of your life. I think like as a practice, it's really important. Um, I don't know, I feel like this experience was a lot more mentally challenging for Ben um, out of all of us. Uh, I think me and Nick had an easier job <laughs> in terms of uh, maintaining that, that mental space. Um, I think there were lots, a lot of parts for me of this that were really cathartic um, because I do really value having conversations about mental health and, and so being able to play a character who cares so deeply about that and um, reading, reading, first of all, reading something that so powerfully um, like centered our shared humanity really made me feel seen and understood as a person and so working on it and feeling seen and understood in my own depression or my own anxiety was really cathartic for me. Um, so yeah, I don't know, Ben, do you wanna take the question? That, that was beautifully <laughs> said. I'll just add that all of these people sitting to my left, all of these brilliant ensemble members were a huge reason why it was a very um, handleable experience because it's obviously very weighted material and each of them were so generous um, with me both on screen and off particularly this kind of little bubble that we were able to have of, of uh, Caitlin and Colton who aren't present, who are both brilliant in the movie, Caitlin Deaver and Colton Ryan. Um, um, yes, yes, for Caitlin and Colton. <laughs> um, and, and of course, Amanda and Nick, and you know, just having this little kind of gaggle of fake teenagers um, <laughs> was, <laughs> was really, really special. And particularly for me, getting to live with, with Caitlin um, and come home to her and watch silly television and just unwind and have a, a bit of a family throughout was, was very, very helpful. In our audience, uh, we have a, a partnership with Your Mom Cares. And we have the wonderful Sharon 
Feldstein, who is here representing this organization who works with kids. My first question is, why is suicide the second leading cause of death of kids 10 to 24 years old in this country, and it's the best kept secret in town? So I'll start with that. So you're not supposed to die when you're a child or a teenager. And the leading cause of death for teenagers is accidents, and the second leading cause of death is suicide. And part of that is that the brains of teenagers are very different than the brains of children or adults. So when a teenager tells you, I hate you, or I'm miserable, or I love you, I'm freezing, I'm boiling, you don't say, no, you're not. They really are freezing or boiling. They feel everything very intensely. And therefore, when they get hopeless, when something terrible happens, um, they don't think it through. There isn't a cause and effect. They just react. And many times, and, and by the way, the numbers are staggering, over 1.2 million teenagers show up in emergency rooms every year because of suicidal behavior or actual suicide attempts. 600,000 teenagers, um, that was the rate four years ago, it's now 1.2 million. And we will lose 6,000 kids to suicide this year from suicide. That's, it's unacceptable. It went up by 20% in the last four years. And COVID has been w very bad for these kids. The second problem about the secret is the fact that um, people are afraid about the contagion of suicide. So there's no doubt when you have memorial services, when you make a big deal about, you know, look, look what happened in the movie, right? Everyone wants to know Connor, that the, the guy who, or the girl who could have been a loser or could have been an outcast all of a sudden becomes glorified. And so since so many kids are thinking about suicide, they think, well, maybe that could happen to me, that I could be glorified, I could be, that, that's why 13 Reasons Why was such a bad movie because it made suicide look good. So that's a problem of contagion. That's not the problem that we should not talk about it because if we don't talk about it, we can't prevent it. If we can't recognize the kids who suicide are more likely to be depressed, are more likely to have an anxiety disorder, are more likely to have something that makes them feel hopeless, and if you don't talk about getting help, reaching out, you know, basically you're not alone, please reach out and do something, you will continue to lose kids to suicide. And it's, it's truly preventable. I have a second question, because this one I think is really important. <laughs> not that the other one uh, my second question is, do you agree that parents should not be afraid to talk to their kids as it will never be the reason that they take a negative action? Because so many parents are petrified to talk to their children. And from the research that we have acquired, that will never be the reason a child um, has suicidal ideation or dies by suicide. Do you agree with that? Right. So uh, look, there's lots of things you should talk to your kids about that we avoid. And let's use the word kids. You should have conversations about mental health, about sexual behavior, about drug use when kids are kids, not teenagers. Um, and parents, by the way, forget that they are the most influential uh, person in a child's life. Even during adolescence, where the peer group becomes more influential than it was before, parents then pull back. It's not the time to pull back. You should lean in. It doesn't mean that they'll listen to you or follow your advice, but you're still an important influence. So talking about sex, talking about your attitudes toward premarital sex or safe sex, talking about depression, talking about anxiety, talking about how suicide is not an answer uh, are important discussions that parents should be having more than once during the child's childhood, so then it becomes easier when they become a teenager. They're more moody, they're less likely to want to have a conversation with you. You got to put some money in the bank early. I love that. And, and this is a conversation that has just been amplified exponentially by this film. And I, I want to throw to Danny, I can kind of see you there. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, I, Great suit, by the way. Um, but I want to, I guess, figure out why this role as the dad um, really spoke to you and if it affected you as a father. Um, because I do think there is a nuance there um, when we're talking about parenting and we're talking about these um, issues. Well, thank you for that question. And thank you, everybody, for showing up tonight. Um, I am a father. So reading the beautiful uh, script and uh, listening to the music, uh, there was an immediate visceral reaction to it. Um, having two boys who are adolescent, who are teenagers, and imagining what Larry must be going through 
uh, was heartbreaking. Uh, it was emotional. Uh, and I, <laughs> it's going to sound weird, but I look forward to playing that. Uh, because I thought that it had a, uh, a social resonance that was important, that there isn't one way to grieve. Uh, and the, the complexity of his grief, of all of the grief that was seen on, on screen, um, how it ranged from sometimes anger to intense sadness uh, to guilt, uh, that range of emotion, uh, I thought, was not only uh, an incredible and beautiful and poetic challenge, but one that was necessary uh, to pay that price so that maybe people could see themselves reflected in what we were, uh, the story we were telling. Uh, and of course, the more we talk about the issue, uh, the more uh, profound it gets because I get to go home to my two boys. Wow. Going back there? Is, is it me? Cool. Um, one of the most poignant things I've learned in my uh, relationship with mental health is you can't love depression out of someone. I take that to heart all, all the time when I meet people that have this. So my question to you is, uh, Dr. Kopovitz, as a parent of teens, sometimes the only thing we have in our toolbox is love. So how do we know when we need to move from love into actually reactionary things like therapy and things? Are there markers that we need to be on the lookout for? Sure. Thank so, you. You know, I, I think the Great. telltale sign of the difference between being demoralized, you know, bad things happen, we feel crummy, you know, we don't make the team, we don't get the girl, we don't get the guy, we fail the test, we feel bad, and that's a human condition. I think the difference between that and, for instance, depression is that it lasts for two weeks at, at least. It affects our appetite, it affects our mood, it affects our sleep, it affects our desire to have fun, it affects our sex drive, and that's very different. That's a change, and most parents know what the baseline of their kids look like. And when you see that kind of dramatic change where they're distressed and dysfunctional, they're, they, can't, they can't perform in school or they're chronically irritable, that's the time where as a parent you have to say, you know, if you were bleeding or if you were wheezing, uh, I would take you to see a doctor. And it's my job to figure this out with you. And it's, it's not that you're bad, it's not that you're crazy, it's not that you're lazy, it's that something is wrong. You're not you're not what you were before, and I can't, you know, I can't tolerate seeing you in this much pain, and it would be bad as a parent not to do something. And I think it's really important to keep differentiating that you're not the depression or you're not the anxiety. You are a terrific kid who's struggling with something like wheezing or seizures or, but in this case, with a mood disorder. And I think that that's where the language, where the other, it's another psychiatrist in the house, I love that, uh, who was saying we really should be careful about that, you know, not to call someone, you know, uh, schizophrenic. It's someone who has schizophrenia. It's someone who has bipolar disorder. Um, and you have to remember that this is a total person who now has, you know, extra baggage or a monster on their shoulder that you have to help them with. Another? Uh, I was just wondering, how was it coming back to the character of Evan Hansen after such a long time of not playing him on stage? Did you do anything differently or add anything for the camera or add anything that you regret not doing before on stage? And is there anything that you like learned from uh, yourself or other people playing the role that you took to this movie? Thank you so much for that question. Um, I. I think I was definitely afraid and apprehensive and very nervous to return to the character and to the material because it was a very formative experience doing it on stage in all ways. I mean, it changed my life personally, professionally. Every, everything about my life was different because of Evan Hansen. I'm forever grateful for, the, for this particular piece. Um, and so to reopen something that required a certain amount of, you know, uh, kind of active forward moving away from once I had left the show and kind of healing and returning to myself and reinvesting in my own emotional life and my own thoughts and perspective after spending so much time really worried primarily about Evans. I think to jump back into that was a very scary thing, but 
for me, the fire under my butt the whole time was the idea of what's happening right now, which is the sheer number of people that would have the opportunity to be affected by it and, and to see it and, and hopefully be moved by it because I got to see, again, firsthand in a really privileged way how people's lives were changed and conversations were started by the show. So I think a lot of the kind of translation of the performance and of the character was achieved, uh, of course, with the guidance of my fantastic director, Stephen Chbosky, but also by just the gifted film actors that I was lucky enough to be paired with. I mean, all of them are so deeply authentic and grounded and fully realized and naturalistic. And that's a hard thing to do, particularly in a musical, to keep people feeling so completely real in 360. And so to just meet them where they were and to meet them tonally and respond to their incredibly real emotions and, and, and um, portrayals and sort of human behavior, I think really helped to demodulate and internalize and sort of um, lessen the kind of broadcast uh, characteristics that the performance had on stage, and so I'm really grateful for all of them. Take us on to set and tell us like what it was like to just get those performances out of these actors, and, and it, it's such a, a weighty topic. So what were some of the I don't know, the activities, the, the prep, things you did before you started rolling. I, listen, I, I really feel philosophically I didn't get the performances I think that the actors gave them. And it was my job to make the, the atmosphere as supportive, nurturing, uh, and safe as I possibly could. Um, and to give them whatever they needed for every scene, whether it's like, let's sing first, and then do the scene after, let's do the scene to build up to the song, whatever it was, it was a lot of that because um, I'm, I'm very big on respect. That's my number one thing that I approach everything with. Um, a couple things that I did just, just to help. Uh, one thing is I asked Stephen Levinson here to write the, the history of the, the Murphy Mora family, um, which really, I think, helped, uh, you know, because especially because of COVID, we had so little rehearsal uh, periods, uh, with such little rehearsal time. That got everyone on the same page in a good way. But ultimately, I, I really, I feel that directors often get way too much credit for remarkable performances, when really, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> not to, you know, my, my agent's like, shut up, just shut up. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I really feel that way, that like, ultimately, they were there for each other. And, and, you know, I guess maybe you can ask the actors, like, if there's a couple things that I said here or there uh, that were helpful. Um, but mostly it really was, I, I really, I don't, whenever I work with, with actors, I, I don't really, focus on the actors, like it, there's, it's not the glamour, red carpet, it's not like your resume, it's none of that stuff. I'm really interested in getting to know the person and, and encouraging uh, just that. And I found, especially with something like this, where I knew that I'd, I have these incredible, like in, in some cases, legendary actors, they had to be in the same movie as, as a non-actor for the You Will Be Found sequence. So the more that we focus on the humanity instead of the art or the humanity instead of just like whatever that other part of it is, um, the better off that the movie would be. Just one more, you guys. Uh, you had those moments of just joy and levity in the film as well. It's such a heavy topic. Um, it, it's such an important topic, but it's also important to just make sure that you are, are seizing those moments where you are, ha even if they're fictitious in some cases in the film. But um, take me to set. When did you guys just get you know, free and able to let loose, and was there a moment, anyone can answer this, was there a moment where you guys were just, you know, hanging out and happy to be there? <laughs> I mean, with COVID protocols, I'm sure that yeah, was quite it was very strange. Never mind. I mean, <laughs> it was very strange, I'll let the actors speak to it, because those were, they were the only people who could take their masks off, <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, I didn't see Stephen Chbosky's face till the last day of shooting. Oh, wow. <laughs> I did sing The Carpenters with Caitlin Deaver, and I was super excited. Um, yeah, sorry, but that's I walked, not I w unusual for me to just burst into the carpenters. So. <laughs> I walked downstairs at the, in the di to, to the we were in the Murphy home shooting the Four Forever sequence, and I went up to like our little we would like hang out in the bedrooms between shots to like get away from the COVID of it all, um, and I just heard beautiful singing from downstairs. So I just walked downstairs, and Caitlin and Amy were sort of circling the table, singing in harmony the carpenters together. It was really beautiful. She's amazing. I was pranked by Ben and Nick. <laughs> oh, I didn't know if you were going to share that story. Oh. I'm gonna Go for it, Nick. I'm going to do an abridged, an abridged version. Please. The first time I hung out with them was on Halloween, 
I was invited over for a, a Halloween gathering. Um, and Nick suggested that we do a seance. And, <laughs> and brought out a, a Ouija board and led us in this like really beautiful prayer, honestly, about like honoring spirits and the space and everything. And then this loud knocking comes from upstairs, this ominous knocking. I like run up the stairs to see what's going on and there's a speaker hidden in the closet. Oh, and I forgot to mention that all the lights also started flickering on and off. <laughs> and it turns out that before I arrived, Nick had installed remote controls onto every <laughs> lamp in the house that he could then control from his pocket. <laughs> and that was the first time that I hung out with him. And we committed. I mean, Ben and Caitlin and I probably overcommitted. <laughs> when you get actors doing that kind of thing, it got a little out of hand, I must admit. It's one performance I'm not proud of. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, well you guys, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for this conversation and thank you all for being here and, and joining us in this conversation. I am so excited for this weekend, for so many more people to be in on this conversation. <laughs> <laughs>